Lots of things going on in the world of Linux this week. Let's catch back up by first talking about major changes to the fish shell. And it is officially all ported over from C++ to Rust. As of the latest commit and merge, Fish's core code is now written in Rust instead of C++, meaning it is built and compiled on Rust and has no direct impact on users. If you're going to build it from source, of course it has a change for you. You're going to be using completely different tools in order to compile it. As they've been trying to do this for the last year, I did a different video on how they were successful in doing this and why they thought this was important. But it is important to Linux because it shows a major project successfully porting its entire code base over the Rust. You'll still be able to use everything like you did in Fish, as it is pretty much backwards compatible. But there are a few incompatible changes for those of you who use the Fish shell. As a part of a larger binding rework, bind gained a new key notation. In most cases, the old notation should keep working, but in rare cases, you may need to change the bind invocation to use the new notation. Control C now calls a new bind function called clear command line. The old behavior, which leaves a caret C marker, is available as cancel command line. Random will produce different values from the previous versions of fish when used with the same seed and will work more sensibly with small seed numbers. Variables in the command position that expand the subcommand keyword are now forbidden to fix. A likely user error functions in the handlers will now list handlers in a different order. Just little small things that have changed, but they've also received some notable improvements. As it requests X terms, modify other keys, keyboard encoding, and the Kitty keyboard protocols, progressive enhancements. Fish can now be built as a self-installing binary. A new function Fish should add to history can be overwritten to decide whether a command should be added to history. Bindings can now mix input functions and shell commands. Also, deprecations and remove features, including many, many other improvements. Congratulations to the Fish shell as they've finally released their official stable port. I'm excited to give it a try, and if you are, make sure to check out my other video where I explain in depth what Fish Shell has done in order to port things over. Some other interesting news, EA just open sourced the Command & Conquer, Red Alert, Tiberian Dawn, Renegade, and Generals, Zero Hour, all to the world. The source code was restored from the Perforce archives and is very interesting for open source. The source code is now hosted on GitHub under the GPL license. You can now go through this code and really see how the professional game dev took place. A lot of this is written in C++. I'm wondering if there are going to be other ports of this game available. As it's a rare open source contribution, EA typically doesn't open source its games, especially major franchises like this, Command & Conquer. It opens it up to fan-driven modding and preservation, which is really cool, encouraging community development, historical preservation. And the thing I'm probably most excited about is open source versions like this could help to bring other companies to open source their code as well. Clearly, they're more than likely not making any substantial revenue off of this game anymore. Therefore, giving it out to the public is pretty cool in my opinion. Given EA's history, this is very unexpected and almost speculative on whether this was a genuine goodwill gesture or an attempt to boost goodwill after past controversies. Anyways, a very cool win for open source and gaming. Another interesting one, DeepSeek now has released 3FS, which is the Fire Flyer file system. Say that 10 times fast. It's an open source, high performance distributed file system designed for training AI and getting better inference. As they say here in the source code, a high performance distributed file system designed to address the challenges of AI training and inference workloads. The interesting part of this is it's actually Linux based. It's built on Linux Fuse and uses Rust and the foundation database to leverage modern SSDs and RDMA networks. The features here are strong consistency, high throughput, and efficient distributed storage, specifically for AI models and datasets. So now DeepSeek is entering the Linux arena. As we all know, DeepSeek is a Chinese artificial intelligence company who specializes in large language models. It fueled massive controversy as it open sourced a large language model, meaning it gave it out for free not the training code behind it, and disrupted key players like OpenAI, showing that they had more efficient ways of actually training AI instead of using billions in order to do the same job that OpenAI did. It seems that DeepSeek has a commitment to open source contributions and now even contributing to Linux. It'll be exciting to watch DeepSeek's open source initiatives and how they're going to make AI technologies more accessible to everyone locally. That is, we'll see how they do it in partnership with Linux. And now some interesting GPU recovery patches. 
But before we get there, make sure to smash that like button for me to get the content out to more people. And if you haven't already, think about subscribing below. YouTube can get finicky and you wouldn't want to miss another video like this. Let's talk about Linux 6.15. It has introduced a standard way for user space applications to notify when the GPU hangs called a wedge GPU event. It's currently useful for AMD and Intel graphics drivers and KDE's KWIN is already experimenting with this feature. The experiment here is called GPU recovery and renderer changes. It implements switching the renderer for Wayland sessions at runtime without a fallback path for the GPU using clients and uses that to attempt to give the user feedback at least somewhat unstable system when severe GPU reset happens. And this is important for user space applications so we can understand why the GPU issue actually crashed and, and hopefully remedy things in a recovery mode. As we're seeing more and more patches, including a DRM direct rendering management subsystem update called create an app info option for wedge events. Again, more people are working on this, not just KDE. For example, Xavier here, made a request. I'd really like to have the PID of the client that triggered the GPU reset. So we can kill it if multiple resets are triggered in a row or switch software rendering if it's KWIN itself and show the user-friendly notification of why their apps crashed, but that can be done or added later. And very quick, Andre added this new patch set. For testing, I've used AMD GPUs debug mask options, debug disable soft recovery, and debug disable GPU ring reset to test both wedge events paths in the driver. To trigger a ring timeout, I used this app. And here's the app called GPU Timeout. This development is exciting as it's going to improve the Linux desktop's reliability, especially for gaming and high performance workloads where graphical instability can occur. Hopefully we now can better debug that graphical instability and figure out where it's actually coming from, what process, what app, and it can recover itself because we can figure out, okay, there's a specific process ID that's causing this issue. Let's kill that process ID after multiple attempts of trying to re-render the screen. And if it remains stuck, let's just exit out of it. All cool developments. And of course, it's awesome to see that the KDE team is all over this and focused on it as you would expect from some of the finest developers in the desktop space. They are really after making that user experience better and better. Also this week, we had the Framework second generation event with new updates to their laptops, including the desktop. This was a very exciting event. They went live on YouTube. You can definitely check this out. I'll put a link in the description below so you can watch the event for yourself, but I'm gonna break some stuff down for you real quick. They've announced that the Framework Laptop 13 series will now use the Ryzen AI 300 series processors. It's got Wi-Fi 7, an improved keyboard, translucent bezels, and a USB-C expansion card. It's remaining Linux friendly with a commitment to long-term product support. And pre-orders are now open, shipping in April for starting at $899. They also announced a new product category, the Framework Desktop. Pre-orders are beginning now. And it is a 4.5 liter compact PC powered by AMD Ryzen AI Max processors up to 16 cores, 128 gigs of RAM, and a discrete level GPU. It's also fully upgradable. It uses a standard mini ITX, so it also supports custom cases. Ideal for Linux users, do-it-yourself enthusiasts looking for something that's non-proprietary and want a desktop PC instead of a laptop. Pre-orders are open now. It starts at $1,099 and goes up from there, and it's shipping early quarter three. A pretty big announcement, but you'll notice something very interesting as they are now introducing these Ryzen AI Max processors. It's an interesting move by Framework. I wouldn't have expected this quite from them, as they are also clearly focused on local AI processes, or else we wouldn't be seeing these types of processors because there are better ones out there, more performant. But what's awesome about this is, since it's modular anyway, and repairable, upgradable, you can switch between NPU-driven workloads or CPU-driven workloads. If you want something that's more process-intensive instead of AI-intensive, you could potentially change out the main board on these things with an entirely different CPU or GPU. It's kind of cool. Finally, the Framework Laptop 12, which is a 12.2-inch convertible laptop screen. It's got the Intel 13th Gen Core with stylus support targeted at a wider audience, including students and creatives, this is another exciting development in the Linux laptop space. The Framework Laptop 12 is a very interesting, as you can see here, very modular, just like they've done with all the rest of their laptops. 
but also very friendly when it comes to being used as, well, seemingly a tablet. Very interesting, did not see this one coming, but overall, Framework continues to push the open hardware and Linux first computing forward with these modular laptops. At least we have alternatives to Apple, Microsoft, and other OEMs making it hard to repair our laptops or even interact with them with their proprietary models. Anyways, Framework continues to stand out. Let me know what you think about this event, but let's get into the highest controversy of the last week. Introducing a terms of use and updated privacy notice for Firefox. While you wouldn't think that a terms of service would spark so much controversy, it sure did with Firefox, as they've completely gone against what they stand for. As without clarification in an update that they have now made, it seemed that the terms of service clause granted Mozilla a non-exclusive royalty-free worldwide license to use any information that was input into their Firefox web browser. This caused many to fear the fact that Mozilla could collect any data, use any of that data, and even monetize user data, including browsing history and possibly even content like documents, passwords, or, or messages. It was a wild introduction to the terms of use and really confused people here. Other things that were wild with this new terms of service update was that Mozilla also reserved the right to suspend or terminate anyone's access to Firefox for any reason, which really just contradicts the whole open source and free software ethos why in the world would they do this? It feels like they've gone against everything that they stood for and it felt like they were about to go straight into data selling, which I think they've already caused a lot of damage to themselves as a lot of people have taken against this new terms of service and has now received much community backlash. Many longtime Firefox users feel betrayed and now are switching to forks, including Liberwolf, Waterfox, Icecat, and Florp, or even t jumping ship in entirely and going to things like Brave or Ladybird that are Chromium based. What a blunder here in which their terms of service, they added a more detailed explanation of their data practices and that just muddied the waters, of course. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can read through this yourself, but everything just seems confusing in here. I'll read one portion of this whole thing here. How is your data used? to provide you with the Firefox browser. Mozilla collects certain data, like technical and settings data, to provide core functionality of the Firefox browser and associated services, distinguishes your device from others, remember and respect your settings, and provide you with the default features such as new tab, PDF editing, password manager, and total cookie protection. You can further customize your Firefox experience by adjusting your controls, buttons, and toolbars, and adding features with add-ons. Some Firefox features like automated translation for web pages and alt text suggestions when you upload images in your PDFs are powered by artificial intelligence based small language models downloaded to your device. These operate locally. Web page content PDF images and tab URLs stay on your device and are not sent to Mozilla servers used for training purposes with, without your explicit consent. Note that the other Firefox features may integrate third party AI models as further detailed in the notice. More details to how you can adjust your data settings. You can read more detailed information about the information we collect for desktop, Android, iOS. You can update your data collection settings through the desktop and mobile at any time. For something that's saying how we use your data, I don't think this explains anything. It's just a bunch of word salad, in my opinion, linking you to a bunch of other places where you have to look to in order to actually figure out what certain data that they actually collect, which is just annoying to me. Let's easily lay this stuff out instead of burying it into one doc after another doc or one link after another link. It's just annoying. Anyways, that's my opinion on it. So what's going on with Firefox? It feels like it's been a miss lately, especially when it comes to things like trying the Mozilla AI. That effort seems to have completely gone away. I don't know what they were going to do with that whole deal. And I haven't heard of an update in a while now. Also, I've been inundated with ads on YouTube and other places to use Firefox. It seems like they're just trying to stay afloat at this point with even trying to advertise. And we all know that Google is a major financial supporter of Firefox via the search engine deal. Is this potentially a shift towards a for-profit model to stay afloat because antitrust lawsuits are forcing Google to cut ties with companies like this? I'm not sure, but it seems really weird that they're trying to collect more data here as they try for clarification, even admitting themselves that there were little confusion over this whole thing. Little, I think, is a complete understatement as it has outraged a lot of the community that uses Firefox. It'll be interesting to see what happens in distributions like Debian and Ubuntu 
and whether they're going to actually drop Firefox due to its non-free software behavior. The other thing that I mentioned earlier was Mozilla AI. Are they going to use user data to train AI models? Now let's read the update. We've seen a little confusion about the language regarding licenses, so we want to clear that up. We need a license to allow us to make some of the basic functionality of, of Firefox possible. Well, I question that because how many years have they been running without it? But anyways, without it, we couldn't use information typed into Firefox. For example, it does not give us ownership of your data or the right to use it for anything other than what is described in the privacy notice. It literally says right here, we couldn't use information typed into Firefox. Why do you need to use information typed into Firefox? Are you gonna say that we need diagnostic help for that? That just seems very weird because clearly they've been doing this for such a long time without this terms of service. So why do they need it now? This whole thing feels extremely vague. And of course it's gonna raise concern about data ownership, privacy, and corporate control over this. Users are rightfully angry and distrustful. And a lot of people seem to believe that it has to do something with Mozilla's financial struggles. The way that they are handling this, in my opinion, is completely eroding the trust of the community. I'm not sure how they're going to pull themselves out of this one. Let me know in the comments section what you think about this whole thing. How was the news this week in Linux and open source? Let's talk about it in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe below. You've made it to the end of the video. You're a true fan. Also, smash that like button for me as it gets it out to more people. Catch me in a great community on Discord, and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to SavvyNick.com now and get access to these sheets.